today's debate is on the topic of should we be taxing the internet? Um, that's something of a, um, a catch-all. The actual debate topic that we're going to be looking at today is, of course, whether or not it's legitimate to put GST on foreign suppliers over the internet to New Zealand consumers. Of course, you buy something on the internet within New Zealand, the company you buy from will, will certainly pay GST on it. But uh, typically, if you buy something from overseas, and we all use Amazon and a variety of other overseas retailers, no doubt, uh, you may well be aware that up to about $400, you don't, uh, the company that supplies you is not required to pay GST, and therefore they wouldn't pass it on to you. So the subject of today's debate is, should we be taxing uh, those foreign suppliers uh, via the internet? Um, before I get in to introduce the speakers, just a few points of um, uh, housekeeping, because they should have been up there for you to see and avoid me telling you all, but I'll just give you a quick reminder. Um, first of all, emergency exits. There is one at the rear, my left, your right, as well as one at the front, so in an emergency, please head to your nearest exit. Um, earthquake uh, is the usual uh, earthquake response. Get down under the desk as quickly as possible. Um, mobiles, if you've got one, can you turn it to silent, please, so that we're not interrupted in the middle. And to let you know that we are recording uh, the debate, the recording will run through the whole session, but whereas we hope to put up at some point on my web page the recording of the debate, we will not be putting up the recording of the question and answer session. So that should allow you to ask questions, throw comments um, at our debaters as you like without being worried that your comment will be reported somewhere in the media as from you because we're also operating under the Chatham House rule here, which is that you can report what was said outside the room, but you can't report who said it. Uh, for the case of the speakers, that's a rather odd thing, uh, because once the recording's up on the internet, it's obvious what they said to everyone. But what we're asking is that anyone who wants to report what the speakers say uh, actually gets their permission before reporting it. The reason for that is that the debaters have very kindly, um, as it were, separate from their day job, agreed to present the cases, in the case of Toby, uh, and grant for and against this proposition, they may not be representing their own views. They've agreed to do that to help stimulate debate. And they're certainly not reporting the views of their employers, whether it be Victoria University or um, the Treasury. Uh, the same applies to Lisa, although she's not a, uh, presenting a particular view. Um, you should consult with her if you wanted to write about or report um, some of the material that she presents. Um, so, for those of you who've not been to to the debates before, uh, just a quick word about how we operate. So the rationale is essentially that unlike a usual university seminar where someone comes along and presents the case that they want to make from their paper, what we wanted to do here was see if you could make a case as strongly as possible using a rational argument or and or evidence in favor of something. And then get someone to say, well, can we come up with a rational and perfectly sensible, perhaps evidence-supported argument against it? And that allows people to make a, a more reasoned, sensible judgment as opposed to listening to the rhetoric of some politician who wants to deliberately bias the case in favor of something um, um, or against it. So we've asked the two presenters to present it in that kind of extreme way, and we hope we'll have a bit of fun while, while we do it. Um, and so at the end of that uh, a presentation by the two presenters, Lisa will try and introduce discussion by helping you to work out at least where she sees um, the merits of the two, the two cases. Um, and that should be a stimulus, hopefully, for you to then have you a chance to, uh, uh, shall we say, weigh, weigh into the debate yourself uh, by asking questions and we we'll welcome your comments uh, on the topic. Uh, so let me then introduce the three speakers. Um, Toby Dalgish will speak first. Toby is the research director at the Institute for the Study of Competition and Regulation um, at Victoria University. Um, and I guess the best way to summarize Toby's expertise is that um, he's a researcher in microeconomics, Inevitably being in that centre, he's got a lot of experience in pricing, um, pricing strategies and regulation. So he's a good person to talk about the appropriate way to uh, level, uh, appropriate way to levy prices uh, in New Zealand. But also, Toby co-authored a report um, with one of our summer interns at Victoria University, William Steele, earlier in the year, which was a report um, sponsored by Lincoln Gold at Booksellers New Zealand to address the question of whether or not there should be GST on foreign supplied internet sales. So uh, Toby's obviously well qualified to, to make the case for uh, in the debate. And then Grant Scobie is, uh, well I guess Grant is best described as one of New Zealand's best respected 
research and policy economist, after a decade long, or more than a decade, I think, leading a pretty much world-renowned agriculture economics institute in Colombia in Latin America, Grant came back to New Zealand in the late 1990s, and since then, after a spell at Waikato University as professor there, he joined the Treasury and has been a principal advisor uh, at the Treasury, specialising in research areas of, on housing um, and savings. I should point out that Grant is actually, and um, we're grateful for his presence here today because he's recovering from a pretty seriously debilitating illness, um, and so he may need to uh, sit down at some point. If he does, uh, uh, just uh, be aware of that. Um, I'm told the illness is an adverse reaction to drugs, which I have a suspicion might have to do with this period in Colombia. Um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure if it was that sort of drug that he was talking about. <coughs> um, Lisa Marriott is uh, an associate professor at Victoria University uh, in the School of Accounting and Commercial Law. Uh, and Lisa also co-authored the report that I mentioned a minute ago um, on GST on internet sales uh, with Toby. But she's also recently authored a paper on the issue of whether GST should be used to, to fight obesity. So she's someone who knows a bit about exempting things from GST or changing the value of GST. So I'm sure she'll provide a, a very helpful introduction uh, to the two speakers. One final point to note, neither of the two presenters have been allowed to see what the other one says. So they will have an opportunity at question and answer, presumably, to react to what the other one says. But they are speaking from a position of ignorance, shall we say, at least in, in that respect. Uh, so without um, further ado, uh, let me invite Toby to kick off the debate uh, to make the case for why we should tax it to that. Thank you. Okay, um, well, I'm going to talk you through basically what I think is sort of the main argument here. Um, to start things off, you've got to think a little bit about why GST is a good idea. And basically the reason is that most taxes are generally fairly distortional for taxpayers. If we think about a income tax or any kind of consumption tax, they encourage people to work less hard. You're not going to get as much in terms of consumption for a given amount of work um, if you have an income tax, that's going to affect interest rates that you get paid on any kind of deposit or investment, and that's going to distort your decisions about how to stagger your consumption through time. And if you've got a tax which targets particular goods as opposed to other goods, or some goods are exempt from that tax, then you're going to find that that's going to distort your consumption behavior in the cross-section, so you're going to find yourself consuming more cheaper because of the tax and less things that are more expensive. So any of these distortions makes it expensive to levy, levy taxes, so it's hard to achieve a given level of government spending. Um, so generally we would regard these as sort of the cost of getting money out of the taxpayer's pocket and into the government's pocket. Um, now, we could argue about how much the government should be spending, should we have low taxes, should we have high taxes, but in terms of an efficiency point of view, a universal goods and services tax is a fairly cheap way to get money out of the taxpayers' pockets and into the government's pockets. So we might well think that having a universal goods and services tax is a good way to, to, um, to raise money for the government without causing too much debt or cost. Um, so that's sort of the background. That's why we like the idea of GST. So now we want to think a little bit about what we want to do about the internet side of things. And we sort of have to ask the question then, why are people buying things on the internet? And it's undoubtedly true that some people are buying obscure products. I mean, maybe you've got a fascination with pigeon racing or something, can't get your books or magazines about it in New Zealand shops, and so you're popping onto Amazon in order to get something that's unavailable otherwise. Um, maybe it's convenient to buy on the internet. <coughs> shoe size or shirt size or whatever, and you know, spending the whole morning hunting about and rubbaging through racks, you can just go to a clothes shop on the internet and say, please give me a shirt with a collar size 39, and a couple of weeks later it arrives in the mail. But really, for a lot of people, one of the reasons they're shopping on the internet is just because things are cheaper. They can buy things cheaper overseas. 
So there could be several reasons why it would be cheaper to get more software. One of them would be an argument about efficiency. Maybe if I just run a warehouse that's situated somewhere on the outskirts of a city with fairly convenient postal access, that's just a much more efficient way for me to run a business than having a chain of shops that have to have staff on hand to serve people, may have to be in a downtown area, and may have to manage inventories that are more expensive to keep because the, because the rents are higher. It may be that by situating myself in a different country, I can be more efficient for labor or rental costs. Maybe if I base my operations in China instead of in, say, downtown Auckland or um, you know, maybe somewhere in, in, in the backwoods of America, I can, I can, I can get myself some cheaper costs and that's going to make me more competitive. But the third reason, uh, which is the one we're thinking about today, is tax. Uh, if, as Norman says, you can buy something overseas and GST is not going to be levied on it, then that's going to, that's going to give you an immediate wedge of 15% in terms of the price. So there's this lovely quote Overseas, 
we'd now be making those foreign goods less desirable vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the local providers. So if we took INOV's numbers and scaled them up by 50, so we're, we're sort of perhaps extrapolating a little bit here, we would conclude that putting up the 50 So the next question you'd have to ask yourself is, well, isn't that a good idea? Obviously, it's going to be a big change. Um, but what does it mean for everyone? And who's going to be happy about it and who's going to be unhappy? Well, the obvious people who would not like to see this happen would be foreign exporters who are shipping things to New Zealand. I mean, they be national in their teeth with limited range. They lose sales, customers, the customers switch to domestic providers. So they would clearly be losers from us. Domestic retailers would clearly be the winners because they've just had a, a disadvantage taken away from them and they would all gain extra, gain extra sales and that would be good for their profits. So they're obviously going to be um, beneficiaries of raising this tax. So then you'd probably say, well, what about me as a consumer? And probably some of you in the audience are saying, this guy's going to jerk. He's just said he'd like to put a tax in that's going to hit me and I'm going to have to I'm going to lose my nice little tax in the hole and I'm going to be worse off. So why should I want to do that as a consumer? So at the sort of first glance, you would say, well, this is good news for domestic retailers. It's bad news for foreign people selling things in New Zealand. And it's bad news for households. So that's your first guess of households. But then you start thinking a little bit harder about it. And you say, well, what about the government? So the government's actually kind of better off for raising this tax because they now bring in more tax revenue. So they're collecting more GST revenue, but that's not the only thing that they're collecting more of, because they're also getting the income tax from the domestic firms. I mean, when Amazon sells you a book, or, um, or ASOS sells you some clothes, they're making a profit from doing that, but all that money is going to the, the US government or the British government that's booked depository. So that tax is escaping from that revenue over here, and if the revenue was instead going to so the government is certainly going to get more revenue, period. The nice thing about having more revenue is that means you can provide the same services that you provide at the moment, but you can start lowering some taxes elsewhere. So, for example, you could say, well, given I'm getting all this extra GST money and all this income tax that I wasn't collecting from firms previously, I could maybe start lowering some income taxes elsewhere. So you could, for example, start lowering the income tax rate. And, of course, as we mentioned before, your income tax is far more distortionary than your GST. So you could still balance the budget and you could give the households a tax break. So really when you actually look at the households, yes, you're going to lose because you're going to start paying GST on the books, clothes, and pieces of software and media that you're buying overseas. But um, when you think about the fact you could actually be getting an income tax cut, you would probably actually be better off. You'd be better off because you wouldn't be paying that income but also, you'd be in a less distorted situation. You'd no longer be saying, well, I'm kind of just buying a lot of these things overseas for the heck of it to get this tax break. That tax break goes away so you can consume where you please without feeling like you're, you're being made a fool of. And at the same time, you're losing some of your other distortionary taxes so you can make more optimal decisions about your labor, your leisure, your savings, and your investments. Okay. So that kind of takes us, why we like a GST, is it a big deal that we have a GST? Yes. Is it a good idea to, um, to try and get rid of this uh, disparity between whether we collect GST or not? Well, it seems like a good idea. The next question comes in and says, well, lovely idea, but maybe it wouldn't work in practice. Is it economical? Is it, is it economical to do or is it going to be far too expensive to collect? So, um, Electronic transactions currently completely slip under the radar and don't, don't, and don't, don't have any taxes associated with them. 
We have a de minimis model bridging influence. So if you have a look at that plot number for New Zealand, depending on what you're bringing in and whether it attracts tariffs or, or similar, when you bring a physical good in, it could trigger customs um, attaching a uh, attaching GST to it anywhere between 226 and 399 dollars. So that depends. You know, if there's a tariff in there, that could could kick it over the over the de minimis early. So that's a fairly high number. You can bring in quite a bit of stuff. Now, if we look to our friends across the ditch in Australia, theirs is even bigger. Theirs is about a thousand Australian dollars, which is at that time of when Will wrote his little um, little piece, it was about twelve hundred. So clearly, they've got an even bigger problem than we have in that some really substantial items can be brought in and not have the tax levy. But what about some other countries? Have a look at Canada. They're levying taxes at twenty-three dollars and seventy-three cents. China is doing ninety-five dollars. South Korea is doing one hundred and sixty-four dollars. The UK is twenty-seven dollars. The USA is two hundred and thirty-seven. Our de minimis is pretty high in the grand scheme of things. A lot of these other countries are managing to levy this sort of tax. So it doesn't seem that it's a gratuitously expensive thing to levy the tax. So looks like other countries are managing to do it. Looks like it could be a good idea for us. So how would you actually do it? Um, so one uh, way to deal with it, this is the way that the UK, for example, deals with, just to say, well, pay the tax is your problem. So, so if something arrives in the post office and you haven't paid VAT on this in the UK, they hold on to it until you show up and give them some money and then they release your item. So that means you've now got a transaction cost of going to the post office collecting your good rather than just having it delivered to them. You could similarly get um, couriers to deal with this, and the couriers will deal with this for large items in New Zealand. I'll just say, we had a certain amount of processing costs involved in dealing with customs, that gets added on to your shipping costs, and that's kind of your problem as an end consumer. If that's irritating for the consumers, that gives an incentive to foreign retailers or foreign exporters to deal with the problem for you. If Amazon wants to make your life easier, they can collect the tax for you, they could avoid you having to deal with this onerous transaction with your, with, your, uh, with your post office. The second suggestion, and this would be potentially quite a good way to deal with a lot of our little electronic transactions, would be to just say, well, that's, that first one's not going to nab you by a piece of software from some kind of online company, because there's nothing physical to, 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 to catch and hold on to until you pay your tax. Um, so one other way to deal with things would be to say, well, let's just ask the credit card companies to whenever a New Zealander does a transaction with somebody overseas to just ping them the 15% and that will get the GST dealt with without some foreign company having to worry about what the heck's the New Zealand tax. The slight problem there, of course, is that if you do ping all the people um, through the credit card companies, you're going to have problems at tax time because if you've been traveling overseas, you stayed in a hotel, you consumed that stay in the hotel overseas, you shouldn't have paid GST on it. And yet, your credit card company will have just gone, there's a New Zealand credit card buying something in Australia, big, there's the GST, and you'd have to come tax time, claim that back. So you would you would sort of still put a certain onus on the, on the, on the, um, the end customers, but in this case, you'd be saying to them, you've got to claim back the things that shouldn't have had GST. And I guess the third way would be to say, well, what about if we entered into some tax treaties and just said, well, what if we collect your GST or your value-added tax on goods that are being shipped from New Zealand and you reciprocate by collecting our tax on, on your items? So I think that's really um, my argument in a nutshell. I think I've shown you why GST is a good idea relative to income taxes, why we've got a bit of a problem with our current setup, um, how, how much money is slipping through, um, how we might go about it, and I think that's more or less the argument in a nutshell. I think I've finished slightly under time now.
Conference Initiative for running these uh, series of debates on current progress in public finance again and for their kind invitation to participate. Um, um, it's vitally important that you take a few minutes to read the disclaimer to this presentation. I thought it only fair to, to in right and proper that I clarify that why, why I have been selected from a field of thousands as the international tax expert to argue the case for the negative today. Well, on the international question, I, I, I've been to the South Island a couple of times, and that struck me as a pretty foreign place. Um, and, and on the tax question, I, I became aware of and understood the redistributive power of the tax system at a very early age, um, on, on odd occasions I'd be left to babysit my younger sister, and if she reported that I had not performed to her satisfaction, my weekly allowance of one shilling would be taxed by shrippings, and this transferred to my sister. I also learned about the incentives created by tax systems, um, and I'll leave you to imagine the probabilities um, for bribery inherent in such a system. And as is well known, uh, X is the distance from home and dispersed is a, dip, a drip under pressure. Um, so with those credentials, um, uh, I would strongly advise that if you have any questions on international tax matters, at the end of this, you refer them to Robin Oliver or Matt Bench. Um, now, um, I'm going to argue um, that um, I'm going to address each of these points um, that the case for the affirmative uh, has made. And in doing so, uh, reveal the totally and utterly groundless base for the affirmative's case. Um, but let me start with, with um, the theory of the second best. I want to start by addressing economic efficiency and draw on this bit of basic theory in economics. Um, so let me remind you about the theory of the second best. It's, the theory of the second best is all pretty arcane stuff, but to put it in technical terms, it runs something like this. If, if we take a given economy and one price or one market is screwed up, and for whatever reason it can't be sorted out, which would be the first best uh, option, then there exists the possibility that by stuffing up another market, we could make ourselves better off. Um, did you get that? <laughs> um, so, so, so what you ask, that has got to do with, with the present case. Well, it's well established that there are distortions in the pricing of, all, of goods sold on the internet, including music, movies, books, software, and so on. This is achieved basically by the ability of international sellers to segment markets and, and charge differential prices. They do this by identifying the internet protocol, the IP, of the buyer ordering online, which is why I have my daughter who lives in the US order for me very often. To illustrate, a recent Australian parliamentary inquiry found that the average price paid by Australian consumers for iTunes was 67% above the price in the US. In New Zealand, a Windows 8 upgrade will set you back $249, in the US, that would be 149 New Zealand dollars. So while shipping costs and consumer laws might account for some of the differences, it's plain that sellers have been able to discriminate and there's little we can do about it. However, if we then tax these items, we simply compound the distortion and make the matter worse. By not taxing them, at least we provide some offset and improved efficiency by not distorting relative prices further. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that our tax system should be fair. Sadly, the affirmative's case moves us away from this noble objective. Consider for a moment, if you will, of all the music and movies and games downloaded and purchased by the internet, some 84.23% is done by 15 to 24-year-olds. This group is amongst the lowest income folk in our society and my opponent wants to tax them, in the end they'll just end up adding more to their student loans, covering and creating further incentives to leave for Australia. This would be an outrageously regressive move and 
should be stamped out on equity grounds alone. Consists another version of taxing earnings from a paper round. Society simply cannot and will not tolerate such pernicious intrusions by the state. Mr. Chairman, not so many moons passed, we were swept up in a wave of national euphoria as we launched the knowledge wave, or perhaps it launched us. In any event, it served to underline the vital importance of building knowledge, the knowledge base of our society to enhance our growth and productivity and to bring us all greater wealth and happiness. Sadly, it seems that the, the left hand break, uh, that's a technical term um, in surfing for those who might be up to date with the lingo, um, remains better in Bondi than Lyle Bay, and we have seen another 100,000 people leave for the West Island since the Knowledge Wave conference engulfed us. <coughs> Chairman, there can't be a solitary thinking person, and even some of the non-thinkers, who would not support the need to redouble our efforts and catch the wave and build our knowledge society. Can I respectively point out to my colleague for the affirmative that by taxing the import of books, software, etc., this simply raises yet another barrier to building a knowledge society and in the long run reduces our productivity and economic growth. Mr. Chairman, it was staggeringly notable that my colleague for the affirmative made no mention at all of the potential damage to the environment that his proposal could cause. So let me just outline some 101 economics to illustrate the potential environmental catastrophe that is lurking in this pernicious plan. At the margin, taxing internet purchases will effectively raise their price and reduce the demand for foreign currency. This in turn will lead to an appreciation of the exchange rate, and the consequence of this will be to hurt exporters such that most other exporters will be driven out of business, leaving infant formula as our only major export. <laughs> Dairying will expand, and before long, Eden Park and half of field land will be converted to dairy. Effluent will be running down the leafy streets of Remuera. This long run damage is simply unthinkable. <laughs> The affirmative would have us add GST to internet purchases on the grounds that, that would level the playing field. But the argument doesn't hold water, as we already exempt rent and financial transactions. And mark my words, we may well be adding broccoli and bananas to those exemptions before long. More critical is the fact that I'm entitled to a $700 tax duty-free exemption for, for goods purchased duty-free. So it is quite beyond me as to why we would want a tax system that allows me to buy an overseas made camera at an airport for $401, collect it on my return and pay no GST. And if I ordered the identical item online um, and, pay it and pay GST. And by the way, if we wanted a low rate tax system, then surely the rate has to be zero, doesn't it? Let us think for a moment about the cost of compliance. The probability that these costs will exceed the revenue collected is so close to one that almost further discussion is futile. But if we persist with this mad proposal to tax internet purchases, we will simply have tax consumers transfer the benefits to jobs in a swollen tax bureaucracy, robbing resources out of the productive sector, protected a bunch of retail outlets charging monopolistic prices, in which in large part are foreign owned anyway, and created a net welfare loss for New Zealand. Do we seriously think that international credit card companies will kindly offer to collect the tax for us? Given their market power, then should they happen to agree, they'll extract rents that will make rates charged by loan sharks look puny. Now let me turn to my final argument, and that's the question of incentives. If purchases via the internet get taxed, how long will it take smart Kiwis to find other, other ways? We must never forget how creative Kiwis really are. Who else on this planet, or any other planet for that matter, would have had the creativity to connect a, a bit of number eight wire to a car battery in order to control elephants? A fundamental theorem describes
describing how this country works runs something like this. For every regulation or tax imposed by the state, there will be at least 87 ways around it, and that's just by lunchtime on day one. I've consulted with international tax lawyers, and as one would expect, there is a potentially infinitely elastic supply of evasion mechanisms. These will be prepared on the basis of the announcement of any change and will be very ready to implement within seconds. Let me explain roughly how, how, how this works. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with a randomly chosen New Zealand-based consumer planning to buy on the internet. For argument's sake, let's just call him Norman. Norman sends off his order to a website that happens to be run out of Nigeria. They transmit the order to Amazon, who has it delivered via DHL. My sense is that customs may have some difficulty in convincing the Nigerian company to transmit the tax to New Zealand. The proposal to tax the, to, to tax the internet is barking mad. In addition, I have clearly established that it is economically inefficient, it is highly regressive, it reduces productivity and growth, it is potentially environmentally damaging, it violates the principles of a good tax system, it's impractical without huge compliance costs, and it creates a system of perverse incentives. I've addressed each of these issues, and you'll agree that the case for the affirmative has more holes in it than a block of Swiss cheese. Mr. Chairman, we don't really need another policy with these characteristics. It would simply add to the already extensive list of policies that we continue to inflict upon ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grant. I don't think anyone can accuse these two of presenting a case that was hard to put a cigarette paper between them, as they sometimes say. Um, so that gives Lisa ample opportunity to help us make a decision between whether we think Toby has made a stronger case that we should adopt or Grant has made a stronger case that we should adopt. So, over to Lisa. Yeah. 
and you'll see that Toby has addressed all of these in his presentation as well. So, first of all, efficiency. Now, despite being a non-economist, I completely understand the value of efficiency. Now, the opponent's argument is that internet, or the presence of the internet, facilitates price distortions. So, therefore, by adding a tax to a already distorted price, we're making this situation worse. Now, this is countered by our proponent, who certainly did not disagree that taxes are distortionary in, gen in general. Uh, you heard the discussions on the decisions that need to be made between work and leisure, and between savings and consumption, and so on. However, the uh, proponent counters with the argument that taxing internet purchases with a universal GST is one of the least distortionary ways to raise revenue and therefore, from an efficiency perspective, is preferable to other forms of taxes that may exist. Now, point number two was equity. And again, as a non-economist, I do certainly appreciate the value of equity. Now, the opponent suggests that our poor youth, who are the primary online consumers, our 18 to 24-year-olds, they are going to bear the burden of these taxes if we were to consider taxing all by Toby. Often products themselves are cheaper when purchased online, so it's not to say that even taking into account the additional tax, that the increased cost to our young consumers from online purchasing, um, and they, they're still likely to potentially be in the money, notwithstanding this additional amount. Now, when it comes to our third point, the potential for reduced productivity and growth suggests that we run the risk of creating barriers to building a knowledge economy. So what we're potentially doing is denying our youth the ability to purchase valuable sources of knowledge online. Books, I think, was one of the examples that was raised here. Now, I do tend to speak, a, oh, I intend to speak a little bit from experience on this one. I am an academic, um, I am uh, a lecturer here. And what certainly does appear to be the case, and I think some of my lecturer colleagues in the room would agree with me here, is that Generation, uh, Generation Z, I think we're up to at the moment, certainly do seem to like to do their learning online. And as noted by the proponent, there are plenty of online knowledge sources that are widely available and often freely available. Now, when I look through a reference list on an assignment these, well, an assignment these days, I'm, I first of all am grateful if there is a reference list, I'm extraordinarily impressed if there are any sources at all that are not sourced online. In fact, to be honest, I'm pretty, pretty happy if there are sources that are just not referenced from Wikipedia. So I'm not entirely <laughs> convinced. Well, let me show I'm guilty of this myself when this topic was raised. The first thing I did was hop online and start, um, start putting words into my Google search engine. So I'm not entirely convinced that we're um, impeding our knowledge economy growth with the suggestion of taxing online purchases. Now, the opponent suggests that good tax principles are breached with the introduction of taxes on internet purchases. However, as good tax system principles are already breached in many, many cases, um, uh, rent, for example, financial transactions, then what is one more breach going to, to what is it going to make a difference? Now, the proponent suggests to counter this that a GST system is better with the least amount of exemptions possible. And I think it's generally pretty much accepted. So the inclusion of online purchases in the GST system potentially removes some of those current distortions. In particular, the de minimis threshold of 15% as it is at the moment uh, provides a, a 50% implicit subsidy in many circumstances for offshore retailers. So the question is really, do we want to leave something that's broken just because it's broken, or, or do we want to potentially try and fix it, at least partly, if we can? Now, our penultimate point. So the cost of compliance is certainly an issue with this topic. There's no question around that. So as um, the opponent observes, it, is, it will be costly to collect the taxes on online purchases. But the extent to which the cost of collection is in excess of the additional revenue that may be collected is not known. However, what we do know is that this is not a New Zealand specific issue, and this is a 
global phenomenon. And as noted by Toby, collecting GST on online purchases of low value amounts is being done by other countries. You saw the biggest of the UK and Canada that Toby put up on his slide. They're fairly low value amounts that are being collected at the moment, which does lead to the assumption that this may be financially viable. And Toby did provide some examples of how that could possibly be possibly happen. And then we come on to our last point, which is incentives. Now, our opponent suggests that innovative Kiwis are going to find ways to avoid this tax. We're all going to become mini Starbucks and little Googles, and we're going to be able to avoid this tax. And of course, the presence of a tax, any tax, does generate incentives to not pay that item. Certainly, no question of it. However, as suggested, there is also the potential for increased domestic online retail sales. Uh, 27% was the figure that was suggested. And of course, that does, as also noted by Toby, has the potential to increase domestic employment, increase income tax revenue to the government, potentially uh, we get increased services or we get lower tax rates, all of which seem like pretty good outcomes and may counter that incentive to not pay the tax. So, this is an important issue. There's no question around it. The online sales figures for Kiwis last year, we purchased $3 billion of um, items online. 15% uh, of that is about, uh, well, it's precisely $450 million. So we have, been, obviously, there will be costs associated with collecting those amounts. So we have to think about whether this is a sum of money that we might like to, to um, think about collecting, particularly given the speed with which we are adopting and increasing our internet purchasing. So that's not for me to decide whether this is a good idea. That's to the author. It's up to you to decide that, and I will hand back to Norman to...